Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'd like to take a second to introduce myself. My name is John Cap. I'm the vice chair of NEMCON. Uh, on behalf of myself and the entire NEMCON staff, welcome to the Friday night session. Uh, we started this session a couple years ago to really just add something new to NEMCON. Uh, so we hope you guys are liking it. Um, before we get on with our talk and our featured uh, presenter tonight, I just want to go over a few things uh, regarding the convention and regarding uh, NEMCON in general. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, unfortunately, Ozzy Wynn um, became ill uh, and he was not able to make it. Uh, we apologize for that. Uh, we did get Mark Caprice. Calabrese. Oh, I said it like 10 times before I got up here. So uh, we got him to replace him. Uh, Mark has been on Fool Us. He's had uh, a couple at the table lectures. Um, he has several products out uh, and many more things and he's a solid close-up performer. So we think, we know you're gonna enjoy him. So uh, we're gonna have a great time seeing him tomorrow. Um, and then as far as tonight, um, tonight after the talk, right here, we're gonna have our annual close-up jam. So anybody is welcome to come, bring whatever you wanna play with, work on. Uh, it's a time for us to just hang out share stuff with each other, help each other out. It's really fun. Uh, along with that tonight, that's in here, we also will be opening up the hospitality suite. The hospitality suite is, well, is open to all of you. Uh, it is in 439 on the fourth floor. Uh, there's gonna be some light refreshments and drinks, so feel free to come up, hang out. Uh, you're more than welcome to come up, grab stuff, and then bring it, hmm? 439. Four, 439. <laughs> it's either, it's 439. <laughs> Take your pick. You knock on either door and see what, uh, what works. Um, but feel free to grab stuff up there and then you can bring it here and uh, enjoy some snacks, refreshments uh, while hanging out doing a close-up jam. Um, so without further ado, Joining us via audio message recording, Eric DeCamps, who ironically also was sick and unable to attend. Uh, so he will be introducing our presenter uh, via audio. Good evening, everybody. This is Eric DeCamps, or at least the voice of Eric DeCamps. First, I'd like to apologize that I can't be there this evening in person, but I'm a bit under the weather. But I didn't want to miss the opportunity of introducing tonight's guest speaker. I've known tonight's guest speaker and performer for more years than either of us would care to admit. He has held careers in many fields. He's been a janitor, bouncer, bartender, writer, magician, police officer, speaker, and consultant. He's wowed crowds with his magic skills and moved audiences to adopt change with powerful stories that capture the bets and wagers of individual choices and the consequences people face because of those choices. He'll tell you that he has one of the oddest jobs in the world. He works for a company that provides prize coverage for contingency contests, contests such as a hole-in-one contest, half-court basketball shots, prize vaults, and super slots. He has spent his life around con men and hustlers and cart cheats, and has been called everything from an illiterate to an intellectual. Please welcome Norman Beck. I want to clear up two things. As far as that card sharks and cheats and ne'er do wells, I didn't have a lot of choice. That was my immediate family. <laughs> and as far as that illiterate part, that was wrong too. My mom and dad got married two weeks before I was born. <laughs> you know, Eric was going to get up here and we were going to have a Q&A for 30 minutes. And so whenever they told me that he wasn't showing up, they said, I need to talk for an hour. But after that introduction, I only got to talk for about another extra 10 minutes. So that was good. <laughs> you notice I'm wearing a suit. And you don't see guys from Texas in suits very often. But if you do, you're going to hear one of three things. You're going to hear, you may now kiss the bride. Sorry, a little further away. May he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And the most common, 
Will the defendant please rise? <laughs> you know, this coronavirus got everybody scared. Well, a year from now, we're all going to laugh about it. Well, most of us. <laughs> And I don't know if you heard it or not, but the man that invented the crowbar died today, destitute. Come to find out, crows don't drink whiskey. <laughs> well, I do have a very strange job. I work for a company where insured insure game shows all over the world, so I fly around the world and try to give away money. Things like hole in one at golf tournaments and half court shots at basketball games, field goal kicks and whatnot. But magic has had a big part of that. And so for the next few minutes, you're going to step into my world. And it's a little different than what you all are maybe used to. So when I first started 28 years ago, the first thing that I ever did where I messed up, by the way, I messed up a lot. So hopefully you'll learn from my mess ups and you won't mess up. One of the first things I did was Hockey, something I'm sure most of you know a lot about up in this part of the world. In Texas, we don't have a lot of it. This is a template where if you hit a, a puck and it goes through the template, you could win $10,000. So this client called up and they said, we want to do this. I said, OK. And then the day of the event, they said, we want to put a hole on the left and a hole on the right and a hole in the middle. If it goes through the hole on the right, or the left, they win 100 bucks, but if it goes through the hole in the center, you pay. And I said, that's fine. So they did the shot, it went through the hole on the right, and the next Monday morning, I wrote a check for $10,000. The reason it went through the hole on the right, it ricocheted off the back, came out the center, and I didn't put in the contract which way it had to go. So that cost me 10, 10 grand. Now, Fast forward a couple of weeks later, we had a long driver's association. They wanted to do a promotion where if you hit a golf ball and went 600 yards, you'd win $50,000. Point A to point B, it was farther than I thought somebody could do it. So I said, OK, we'll do it. Monday morning, I wrote a check for $50,000. They didn't tell me it was off a six-story building, downhill on asphalt, with a 40-mile-an-hour 40 tailwind. So that was another thing that happened. So after that, I got a call one day from an escapologist. I didn't know what an escapologist was. Turned out that's like Houdini. He said, I've sold a reality TV show for a million dollars, where if somebody ties me up and I don't get away, they get a million bucks. Can you cover it? I said, I can always get out. I said, let me get back to you. So I went down to Walmart. Bought a 100 foot piece of rope and I'm taking it to the store. The store manager stopped me and he said, Why are you dragging that rope through my store? And I said, You ever try to push one? <laughs> so I called the guy and he said, I can always get out. I said, That's why I can't cover you. He said, But why not? I said, Well, if you could always get out, you could always stay in. I said, How do I know that you wouldn't just get tied up? not get out on purpose and then split with a guy who, who tied you up and you get 500000 and he gets 500000 and I end up writing a check for a million. He said, I never thought of that. I said, that's why you get tied up for a living. That's why I sit in Dallas and think about stupid stuff. <laughs> so how did I get this job? How did I get this crazy job? Well, life is very strange because what I find interesting is that certain things will happen to you that at the time you think are small and insignificant, turns out they are very impactful. When I was 13 years old, I lived in a small town in Owasa, Oklahoma. It's the northeastern part of the state. And we had the 100th anniversary of Owasa. And they had a magician. And I went to see him. It was on the main street. There was a big, uh, it was on the back end of a truck. And the guy did some really good tricks. I remember him. He did a squared circle. He did the Chinese sticks. He did linking rings. He did diminishing cards. And he was great. I went up to him and told him I was a magician. I was no more magician than anything in the world. Well, he was nice to me. In fact, the reason I'm here is because of him. Now, what's interesting about this 
He's sitting right there. That guy right there, Sandy Rhodes. I, I thought I'd better introduce him early because at the end you'd be booing him after you finished hearing me talk. No, but Sandy started me. So I got started going to the Magic Club and got involved. And first one thing led to another and I got paid $5 for my first paid gig. And I got 35 and I got 75. And then I went off to college. And in college, two things happened. First thing that happened was I got started playing bridge. I don't know if any of you know about bridge, but it's a real hard game. And when I went home that summer, I met a guy, I found out who the best bridge player was. Just like us magicians, you find out who the best magician is in town. I thought, well, I'll find out who the best bridge player is. I'll talk to him and two weeks I'll be as good as he is. Well, it's been the longest two weeks of my life. <laughs> but, so what happened, I go to this guy, and now they don't tell me what he does for a living. He was a mafia bookie. So I go, to the, I go to his club, and I meet him, and I said, uh, I understand you're the best player in, in Oklahoma. And he said, well, some people think that. I'm not sure. Did you want to play for some money? I said, no. I just want to know how to be as good as you are. He looked at me. He said, play all you can play. Read all you can read. Learn something every time you play, and always play with better players. It was the best piece of advice I ever got. It's true of everything. It's true of magic. It's true of anything in life you want to do. So in magic, all you got to do to be good is read all you can read, watch all the video you can watch, learn from people better than you are, do a lot of magic, and learn something every time you do it. And, you, and that, that's it. Now, what I find interesting about magic, and I'm not going to mention any names, I'm not going to badmouth anybody because I don't think that's right, but I know some guys that get together every week and they sit around, and I want to imagine, if you, if you will, if you want to learn how to dance, how would you learn how to dance? And I said, well, I know these three guys, they get together every Saturday, and they talk about dancing. Now, they don't ever dance with any women, but they talk about it, they watch a lot of videos, they read a lot of books, and they write a lot about dance steps, but they've never actually gotten out on the dance floor. Let me tell you something. You can't learn how to dance like that, I promise you. The only way you can learn how to dance is get a woman and go out and dance. The only way you can learn how to do magic is get out, go to the bar and do magic for them people out there. That's the only way. But these people do it and it irritates me when they perpetuate the, the art by creating tricks just for themselves and they don't do it for the pay in public. So I don't, subscribe to that. I'd rather talk to people that do it every day for real people. People like Bill Malone, Chuck Smith, Sandy Rhodes, and people like that. Those are the people that I want to spend time around. But, so I met this guy who was, like I said, was a mafia bookie, and then I'm in college. And I went to a, to a cast party in a restaurant. And at this cast party, I did some magic. Well, the owner saw me. He said, how much would you charge me to do magic in my restaurant? I said, I'll do it for 25 bucks a night, and you feed me. That was a lot of money in 1978 to a kid from Oklahoma who didn't have nothing. So I started doing magic in a restaurant. I did everything wrong you could do. I mean, I would, if you could imagine it, I did it wrong. But you have to be bad before you can be good. It doesn't matter. So I eventually I got better and better. And so finally, when I found this job, I used the techniques of magic involved in promotion games to figure out how to cheat. Every time we get a promotion, I try to figure out how could someone cheat us and that not happen. So I'm real big on illusion and how to fool people. And not with stuff that's hard. I like stuff that's easy, but I want to give you some examples of ways that you can use magic to sometimes fool people in ways that have nothing to do with magic. I, we did a promotion up in Canada where I had to go to Canada every week to watch One Hand of Blackjack. I flew to Detroit, I would rent a car and I'd go to the border to go across to watch One Hand of Blackjack. So I go to do it, I get to the to the border agent. He said, uh, reason for your visit? I said, I'm here to watch the guy play one-handed blackjack and I'll 
watch that and I'll be leaving. He said, are there any drugs or alcohol in the car? I said, no, trust me, I looked. <laughs> he said, uh, just a minute, he took out a yellow post-it note and he wrote TYT, put it on the dash, he said, pull over there for secondary screening. Now, I didn't know what TYT stood for, but I soon learned it stood for take your time. So three hours later, I'm on my way. So I come back the next week and the guy says, reason for your visit? I said, I'm here to play some blackjack. I'll be leaving sometime later tonight. Any drugs, alcohol in the car? And I said, nope. I didn't make no jokes because I found out if you joke, they don't think that's funny. He said, pull over for secondary screening. So I did the same thing. Secondary screening, no. Two hours later, I'm on my way. So the third week I show up, I took a dozen roses and a bottle of champagne. He said, reason for your visit. I said, I met a woman on the internet. We're having a party. Her husband's out of town. He said, go right on through, have a nice day. <laughs> and all I did was just change. Now, in effect, we were having a party. I did meet the lady on the internet via email. And I'm sure somebody's husband was out of town, just not hers. But they didn't know the difference, so it was, they worked out just fine. Now, sometimes you can use a look. Now, I don't believe in lying. And I don't believe when you do magic, you should ever use gaff cards. It's one of the things that Sandy taught me. You don't ever use gaff cards. You use a straight deck, and you play it straight because you can then do magic anywhere. So unlike some people that might use a, a swing galley deck or a stripper deck or something like that, I don't believe in that. I use straight stuff all the time. That's one of my rules. It may be silly and maybe I shouldn't, but that's the way I work. So I never lie. However, I got to tell you a story. I was in Arizona. I'm going to promotion. I'm running late and I'm lost. Now, that's a bad combination, be running late and lost. So I cut a guy off. Now, I cut this guy off 100%. I was wrong and I was a jerk and I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. And I pulled in this parking lot and the guy pulled in behind me, blocked me. And when I get out of the car, he's doubled up his fist and he's ready to fight. And he's used words I never heard before. And they're not very nice. Words that nobody in this room would even know. Except this guy over here, he might, but the rest of them wouldn't. So the guy gets through cussing me and he's ready to fight. Well, you gotta create the illusion that this is a bad idea. So I looked at the guy and I said, uh, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. I cut you off and I, 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 I wanna apologize. I said, I just got off the phone. I said, I just got a phone call. My wife and nine-year-old daughter were just killed in a car wreck and I'm going in to find out what I need to do. If you want to beat me up, you can't hurt me any worse than I just was hurt. Like that, he said, I'm sorry. What can I do to help you? I said, it's okay. And I went in, you know, but, but I, 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 I lied and I created the illusion to eliminate the problem because I didn't want to have a fight or issue with this guy over something as trivial as me getting in front of him and he had to wait an extra two seconds. So I'm always looking for the psychology behind magic and the way to do things. Like, I'll tell you a little piece of magic, how you get your great service from a really bad waiter. If you go into a restaurant, you wanna get good service. All you gotta do is learn the waiter's name. So when the waiter walks up, if you know his name's John, you say, hi, are you John? And the guy said, yeah. I said, man, I'm ever glad to see you. I got to tell you, some friends of mine ate in here last night. They said the food was good. The only thing better than the food was the service, and you took care of them. I'm glad to see you here to take care of me. Glad you're here. Well, you know, even if he's bad, he's going to give you good service. You can't help it. It's, he's forced to. Now, what's interesting about that is that once he brings the appetizers, I say to him, I say, John, would you send the manager by? And the guy kind of go on tilt and he looks at you kind of funny. 
Oh, no, no, nothing's wrong. I just want to tell you what a great job you're doing. Most of the time people only say stuff when it's bad, things are really good, and I want them to know what a great job you're doing. So that's, that's what I like to do. Now, I've been coming to magic conventions since 1977. That was the first magic convention I ever went to. And in the years of being in magic, I've had three conversations that I've had that I think have important, pertinent information for you that, that, that really matter. In 1977, I was in high school in Owasso, Oklahoma, and there was a, a magic convention in Tulsa. It's called the Cavalcade of Magic. And we had a really good lineup. There were some people named Gene DeVoe and Trudy. There was a guy named Tom Ogden. There was a guy named John Cornelius. A guy named Roger Klaus. You know, these are pretty good, pretty good people. There was one name on there I did not know, never heard of before. His name was Don Allen. Now, you got to remember, I'm 16 years old. I didn't know who Don Allen was. And he was going to do a close-up show. He was going to do a lecture. He was going to do an evening show. And the close-up show started at 10 a.m. And some of the older magicians in Tulsa said, get on the front row, save us four seats. Be there at 9. I said, don't start till 10. He said, be there at 9. We want on the front row. So I go at 9 o'clock, and I sit on the front row, and I wait about five minutes till 10. The other magicians come in, and they sit down. I saw Don Allen. And when I saw Don Allen, I said, that's what I want to do. That's the guy. He's the man. I thought, the rest of them don't know what they're doing. He's the guy. So. I actually got lucky enough because I got to take him to the airport. And that night after the show, I saw him in the dealer room and I went up to him and I said, Mr. Allen, you were great. I love what you did. I've got a chop cup. I've got the big deal. I know how to stack dice. I'm going to do every trick you did exactly the way you did it and use the words you used. <laughs> right. Now, I did not know. I did not know that this was wrong. I was 16. I was a kid. I was stupid. I didn't know any better. And we were in the dealer room, and he stopped, and he looked at me. And when he looked at me, he, I could see he sized me up. And there were a lot of ways he could have handled this conversation. And he said to me, he said, uh, would you do me a favor? I said, sure, anything. What do you want? He said, when you go home tonight, he said, I want you to go in the bathroom. He said, I want to take off all your clothes and get butt naked. I thought, boy, this is weird. <laughs> don't, doesn't seem right to me. But he said, that's what I want you to do. And he said, when you get butt naked, he said, I want you to look yourself in the mirror. And he said, I want you to realize something. You're not me. You'll never be me. He said, my sport coat costs more than your car. He said, the best you'll ever be is second. He said, go out in the magic world. He said, learn to be a magician and learn to be Norman Beck. And don't try to be, do not try to be Don Allen. The best you'll ever be is second. And I said, thank you very much. And that was the best single piece of advice that I ever got. Because what I did from then on, every trick that I ever did, no matter what I learned or how I learned it, I never wanted to be like Sandy Rhodes or I never wanted to be like uh, anybody but Norman Beck. That was my main goal. So that was the first really good piece of advice I ever got that I took and wrote down and burned in my brain and never forgot, never will. After that, I, I got invited to go to a convention called F, 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 F. And I've never been to Factors. That's where I met Eric DeCamps. And I'm certainly glad he's not here tonight because he would have brought up things that I wouldn't have wanted to talk about, <laughs> that I would have denied that might have been true or maybe not. But anyway, I went to Factors. And I learned something about going to magic conventions. It's really smart to go in a day early and leave a day late 
because lots of times people will come in a day early and leave a day late, and they don't have any of the big wigs to talk to, and they'll talk to peons like me. <laughs> well, there was a guy there that had a glove. He had a little glove. He wore it on his left hand. His name was Jay Marshall. And if you had to pick the things that I saw in magic that were poignant and really meaningful to me, Jay Marshall and Lefty is one of them. I could watch it every day. And then we were at the airport. I didn't know Jay Marshall. I didn't know what to say to Jay Marshall. So my brilliant, super intelligent question was, Mr. Marshall, what makes a good trick? <laughs> Probably not the smartest thing I've ever said. He said, it's no such thing. He said, you don't pick out what a good trick is. He said, the audience picks it. He said, find a trick you like 500 times, and the audience will let you know if it was any good or not. I said, what do you mean the audience will let me know? He said, you have to learn to listen to the audience, not to yourself or your other magician friends, because a lot of them don't know any better, but an audience will tell you. They'll tell you if it's good or bad. And so that's what I've done my whole life, is I have a trick. If I think I can sell it, I look at it. When I read magic books, I read them like a cookbook. I read the effect and say, OK, that's the dish. And then I see what's involved and say, well, could I do it or not? Is it something I can do? And if it's outside my skill set, I won't do it. I read a trick the other day that had nine pharaoh shuffles in it. <laughs> I'm not doing a trick with nine pharaoh shuffles. It's just not, it's just not my thing. So, that was the second really good piece of advice. The third piece of advice that I want to tell you about, and by a show of hands, how many people in this room know the name Chuck Smith? Could I see a show of hands? Not that many. Chuck Smith just turned 90 years old. He's from Midland, Odessa, Texas. He's the best magician I know. You take any magician you want, and I'll tell you that in my mind, Chuck Smith's better. He uh, worked his whole life really good. Now, I've got a couple of Chuck Smith stories I have to tell you. How many of you here know Jamie and Swiss? Most of you. I took Jamie to meet Chuck Smith, and we pulled a trick on Jamie. We convinced Jamie that Chuck Smith was a battery collector. So before we went, I had a bunch of batteries, and I said, I got to take these to Chuck, because he collects batteries. He said, what do you mean he collects batteries? I said, you know, like car batteries and stuff. So we took him these batteries, and he was so excited. And Jamie had on a Movado watch. He said, what kind of watch is that? He said, it's a Movado. He said, let me check the battery. He said, Jamie, no, 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 it's OK. He said, how many batteries in your collection? Chuck said, I've got about 3,000. He said, but I had the neighbor's cat got in one the other day, and the sulfuric acid got in the cat, and it caused a terrible smell, and the police got involved, and it's just awful. So we go back to the hotel room, and Jamie said, that old man's crazy. I said, what do you mean he's crazy? He said, well, he collects batteries. I said, Jamie, people collect coins and stamps and stuff all the time. He said, yeah, but those have intrinsic value, and they have reason and purpose. He said, them batteries ain't worth nothing. I said, he may be on the curve or something. So finally, after three days, we let him out on the secret. He didn't really collect batteries. But we had him convinced. We had the illusion set up. But Chuck also had a camera store, and one day, he had had break-ins, and so he was staying in a camera shop to catch people that were breaking in. So one night he was in there, and he heard some noises. And so he's creeping down the hall with his flashlight, and he's 45. And he's going to shoot and kill the burglar. That's what his focus is going to be. He's going to shoot and kill the burglar. I said, Chuck, what was going through your mind as you're walking down the hall thinking about your fixing to take another person's life? He said, I was thinking I forgot to wear my earplugs and it was going to be really loud when I pulled the trigger. <laughs> so Chuck is the smartest magician I know. He knows more about magic than anybody I know. He would be a contemporary of Johnny Thompson. Every magician I know 
that a, a big note and name made a pilgrimage to Midland, Odessa, or Albuquerque to see it. Names that you would recognize would be uh, Steve Freeman, Ricky Jay, John Carmen. You name it, they went. So he doesn't get out much now, but a number of years ago, he was in Tulsa. His wife was in the hospital, and she was dying. She was in intensive care, and she was at the end of the line. Her kidneys were starting to fail, and she's at the end of the line. And I'm up there in the waiting room with Chuck, doing what friends do. You're sitting there, because there's nothing to do. And I get ready to leave one night, and I said, Chuck, do you need anything? Is there anything I can do for you? He said, yeah, Norman, I need some equipment. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I need a couple of decks of cards. I need a red deck and a blue deck. He said, I need a set of sponge balls, a thumb tip, a set of multiplying rabbits. And I thought to myself, this is not the time to be doing magic. This is not the time to be fooling with our toys that we like to fool with. This is just not the time. But he's my friend. He's my best friend in magic. So if that's what he needed, that's what he gets. I said, when, when do you want me to bring these to you, Chuck? He said, could you bring them tonight? It's about 9 o'clock. I said, yeah, I can bring them to you tonight. So I went home and I got the stuff he needed. I put them in a brown paper sack and I took them back to Chuck Smith at 9 o'clock at night. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, knowing that the time was just, at the, we were at the end of the line. So I took in the stuff. I come back the next day and I walked in and he's smiling. He said, I got it done. I said, you got what done? He said, that silly rule they got about you can only go visit your spouse or patient every 15 minutes, every two hours. He said, the nurses, they wave at I can go see her whenever I want for as long as I want. I said, how'd you do that? He said, little magic, that's all it took. He said, that's all it took. He said, I was able to let them see me as a person, not as a patient spouse. So it, learned me, it taught me a really good lesson that magic is more than just tricks. It's a key that unlocks doors oftentimes where there are no keys or windows to get through. And that's what a lot of us miss. We don't realize what we can do with the magic if we just will use it in ways we haven't thought of. Now, I've done a lot of magic for a lot of different people. I, I've performed at the Magic Castle. I've performed every year for Warren Buffett and Bill Gates up in Omaha. I've done that for the last 16 years or so. I've done it for people that, that have money and have power and are pretty important. And I've enjoyed all of it. But I've got to tell you about it, the best magic show I ever did. My wife has her nails done or had her nails done by a woman who would drive to her house and do like, like house calls. She comes around and does people's nails. Instead of going to a beauty salon, she comes to your house. So you, if you think about it, you know, we'll come by at 4 o'clock and she comes by and does it and it's all good. So it's one afternoon. I'm getting off work and I'm coming home and I get pull up in the driveway and I recognize the car belongs to the nail lady. Now, I don't like the nail lady. And she does her nails, but I don't like this woman. She doesn't lead a lifestyle I like. She's always late. And not my kind of person, but she's there. And I, we're going out to dinner, and so I'm late. So I walked in. I don't say anything, but when I walk in, the woman's there doing Joan's nails, and she said, my son, it's his eighth birthday. He's eight years old today. You need to do some magic for him. That's not the way that you're going to get me to do something. You don't tell me to do something. You ask me, and I'll do it, but you don't tell me. And, if you, and you certainly don't tell me if I don't like you. <laughs> but I do like my wife. 
My girlfriend, she's not actually my wife, she's the same as a wife. But anyway, <laughs> I'm on a real short leash. So, I know the best way to do this is I just do a trick for him. Real quick, I ain't gonna like him, I don't like her, and I'll be gone. Be simple. So pretty soon, Josh walks in the room. He walked up to me and stuck his hand out. He said, hello, Mr. Beck, I've heard a lot of nice things about you. I thought, maybe he ain't that bad. <laughs> so, I did a trick for him and he really liked it. I did another trick and he really liked it. And I said, Josh, I've got one trick I'd like to show you, but it only works for somebody who's somewhere between the ages of eight and nine. He said, I'm turning eight today. I said, you think we should try it? He said, yeah, we should try it. I said, you have a dollar? He said, no, sir, I don't have any money. I said, you think you can get a dollar from your mother? He said, yeah, now think about how an eight-year-old asks for money. Mom, can I have a dollar? Mom, let me have a dollar. He doesn't do that. He walked over to his mom. He said, Mother, may I please borrow a dollar? And I thought, wait a minute. Maybe I've got this woman pegged wrong. Maybe she's not quite what I thought. So she hands him a dollar and she comes back and I do a hundred dollar bill switch and I change a one into a 10. I dropped it down. And he picked it up in his eyes, got as big as silver dollars. And he looked at me, and he handed it back, and I said, no, I can't change it back. That's the way it's stuck. You have to take it home like that. That's your, for your birthday. And he didn't know what to say. He said, I never had a $10 bill before. I said, what do you do now? I said, by the way, and I went ahead and took the one out and unfolded it. I said, give this back to your, to your mom. So she didn't, so he got to keep that pen himself. So then Josh gave me a lesson that I didn't know I was gonna get. He said, Mr. Beck, could I ask you a favor? I said, sure. I can't imagine what kind of a favor that an eight-year-old boy is going to ask a 45-year-old man. I can't imagine what it is that he could want me to do. He said, do you think that you could teach me how to do just one trick so I could go home and show my brother so he could feel the same way I felt just now? Guess what? Dinner had to wait <laughs> because I was going to stay with that kid and teach him and work with him until he learned a trick to go home and show his brother. And it taught me something about myself that I didn't realize at the time. And it changed the way that I looked at people because I wasn't looking at them the way I should be always. So that was one of the best lessons that I ever got in my, in my career with magic. Now, I've had a lot of fun things happen, but that was one of the things that I think really mattered a whole lot for, for me. I, I, when I do magic, I think an important thing to do is you've got to make it where it's interesting to the people. Now, I'll tell you a trick that some people do and I don't like. It's oil and water. Now, people, I want to tell you, if you want to take about something boring, you tell a spectator, I got four red cards and these represent oil and these four represent water. They're down falling asleep. They're not going to, I mean, it's just not, it's just no good. And I know people that do it all the time. Now, I think oil and water is a fine trick, but I think you talk about oil and water is stupid. I'll just tell you straight up. Now you can take that same trick and say, what's the most romantic game in Las Vegas? According to James Bond, it's roulette because you can bet on red or black. Now imagine these eight cards represent a roulette wheel. You got four red ones and four black ones. Now would you bet on red or black? How would you bet? Now you change it and that makes sense 
It's something that people will like and enjoy and suck them in. I, I think about doing magic like going fishing. You just throw, the, throw that line out there, kind of roll it in front of them. And I like to start with a question. That, that to me has always been a great way to start a trick is ask a question because it's real hard to ignore a question and say, I've got a trick that I haven't messed up in 27 years. Would you like to see the trick that I wanted? Uh, now now you got you got them inter interested and engaged. Uh, that's to me, it's really, really important. Another thing that I do is I, I tell jokes. I'm a collector of jokes on any subject that you would name. You can name any subject. Give me any subject, and I'll tell you a joke on any subject you name right now. Any subject. Astronomy. Do you know the difference between astronomy and astrology? It's about 40 IQ points. <laughs> <laughs> any subject. Any subject. Psychology. That's getting too close to home. Well, my psychologist said we couldn't talk about that. Pearly gates. Yeah. Say what? Pearly gates. Put the pearly gates? Life after death. Say what? Life after death. Well, <coughs> there were two magicians <laughs> that were friends for over 50 years. And one was on his deathbed. And his friend said, Charlie, you don't have much longer. He said, when you die, if you get up to heaven at the pearly gates, if you get in, he said, I would really like to know if they have magic in heaven. Because if they do, it may change the way I live here on earth. So sure enough, his friend died. So a couple weeks later, he hears the voice, John, John. He looks up, he sees this aberration. He said, Charlie, is that you? He said, yeah, sure is. He said, did, did, did you make it? Did you make it into heaven? He said, just barely by the chin of my chin and chin chin. He said, but I got in. He said, is there magic? He said, well, I got good news and bad news about that. He said, well, what's the good news? He said, the good news is, he said, we have a magic show three nights a week. He said, it's great. He said, all the fa famous ones are up here. He said, we got Slidini, we got Di Vernon. Charlie Miller didn't make it, but everybody other than that, pretty much everybody, pretty much everybody here. He said, well, what's the bad news? He said, you're open the next Friday night. <laughs> Any subject, name a subject. Magic. Magic? So when I was a little boy, my mom said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, Mom, I want to be a magician. She said, make up your mind. You can't do both. <laughs> so that, but, so magic, as I say, I got into it. And then I got this weird, really weird job. And so I travel about, I've got about 5 million miles. I've traveled all over the world. And so every time I get a new promotion, I have to look at it and say, how could they cheat me. How could I use magic? What, what am I missing? How can I somehow get around that? Now, I don't always get around it. Sometimes I get cheated, and I try to learn from that. I got, I got conned out of 50 bucks about two months ago, and I laughed about it. It was pretty funny. I was in uh, California, and I went to a shopping mall, and I was going there to eat. And there's a little kiosk where they're selling stuff. And I'm trying to find the food court. So I go up to this young man, and I said, where's the food court? And he told me how to get there. And I thanked him very much. He said, sir, since I helped you out, he said, would you listen to my pitch? I said, sure. So he was selling shoe polish. He had a shoe polishing kit, you know, leather care. So he gives me the pitch, and as he does, he shining my boot. He's doing a really nice job on it. He gets done, and, he, and all of a sudden I look down and I realized I had one boot that was shined, and I had one boot that wasn't. So I had one black one and one brown one. And I laughed, because he said, you know, you get to, if you buy the polish, you can do the other one. I thought, 
you were really slick. <laughs> how much is it? He said, it's $70. I said, how much do you get for commission? He said, I get 14 I said, tell you what, if you'll sign the other boot, I'll give you 14 He said, well, I could do that, but he said, I'm just two away from making my quota. He said, I could knock it down to 50 and So I gave him 50 bucks and went off because I thought it was, I thought it was pretty funny. I really did. Now, another thing about magic that I think is real important that a lot of us don't do, I think keeping a journal is real important. I have about 14 that I filled out. If any time I get an idea, I write it down. Because if you don't write it down, I don't know about you all, but I'll forget it. That, this guy right here on the front row, he, 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 he and I are from the same school. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in that. And when I do a show, I write down every single show, I write down what I did, who I did it for, what worked and what didn't, and if I got any good lines from it. Because sometimes people will say something and they I got to use that. That's really good. I don't want to miss out on that ever again. So I've done things for as little as 42 cents, and the most money I've ever covered on a single promotion was a billion dollars. That's a single, one throw of the dice for a billion dollars. That's the most money I've ever risked at one single time. So it's been really good. Joke, any subject, go ahead, hit me. An electric car. An electric car. Car. An electric car. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a powerful, that's a powerful subject. <laughs> I invented one, but the problem was the cord was so long. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about my weird, crazy, oh, let me tell you one other thing about magic. That, that's really made a big difference. When I told you I got involved with bridge, that changed the way I do magic. And I'll tell you why. You can do magic for people who don't play cards, and there are certain things you can do to get away with. As an example, you can do an Elmsley count, you can do an easy brown trick where you show them 12 cards and all 12 of them change. You can do the princess card trick where you show them five and then reverse them and show five at the other end. You can't do that with bridge players. Won't work. They'll laugh at you. Because the minute you do that, they realize that those aren't the same four cards. So I had to change the way that I did things because and do techniques where you don't do that because they would pick up on it. Like if you were doing, say, oil and water and you had, say, you know, two sevens and an eight, and you didn't help the count where they see two sevens and the same eight a second time. Can't do that because they'll say, well, wait a minute, you showed, you showed that same card twice. And so I, that was really good for me because I didn't have money to go to bridge tournaments. I didn't have money. I was, I was real poor growing up. So I would hitchhike to a bridge tournament. I would talk to the person that ran it and they'd give me the entry fee for doing a free show, and I'd do a free show, and I'd pass the hat, and I'd sleep in somebody's room on the floor, because I didn't have the money to go, but I wanted to go. I wanted it that bad. So that taught me a really good lesson about that particular thing. So that's kind of my life, and if anybody, I, I think we've got a little bit of time. So if somebody has some questions, I would be love to answer them. Yes, Mayor. <coughs> Oh, what got me the job? Yeah, how did you get the job? A fish. A fish? Fish got me my job. So, yeah. So, the owner of my company is the best bridge player in the world. His name's Bob Hammond. And he was a life insurance salesman. So, somebody did a fishing contest. They wanted to insure a fish for five grand. He couldn't find anybody to cover it. So, my boss said, well, I'll do it. He had no idea how much it was, what it would what the odds were, the chances. He just said, give me $750 and I'll do it. So, guy paid him $750 and he did the promotion and nobody caught the fish. 
So he thought, wait a minute, I made $750 in two days and I didn't do anything but write two pieces of paper. So I had known Bob because I had gone to bridge tournaments and he'd seen me and I'd done, done magic. So when they had an opening, he called me and I went down and he hired. So I knew him through bridge. So bridge, I actually learned about bridge in college. I asked an old man if he wanted to play a game of chess and he said, no, I like bridge much better. It's a much faster game. So I started playing bridge in college and so that's how I got, actually got involved in that's how I got involved in bridge and got, got interested in learning about cons and swindles and gambling and stuff and spent a lot of time in Vegas and whatnot. So somebody else have a question? We got about 10 minutes, so yes? Uh, what was the billion dollar bet? A dice. Just like a name and number? Throw so one dice. Throw, throw, hit six, six and you'll win a billion. <laughs> one time. It was for the lottery for the Texas Lottery. One story about the Texas Lottery that, that's pretty interesting from a, a con standpoint. There was a traveling salesman. This is going to sound like a joke. It's not. But there was this traveling salesman. And he had a girlfriend in Dallas. He went to her and he said, Honey, I've got this scratch card. It's worth 25 grand. Hold on to it. Don't cash it in. I'll be back in two weeks and we'll go to Vegas. Cash it in. He had a girlfriend in Houston, so he goes to the girlfriend in Houston. He said, baby, I got this scratch card that's worth 25 grand. Hold on to it. I'll be back in two weeks. We'll cash in. We'll go to Vegas. So he went, man, he's got two girlfriends, two scratch cards. That was not right. His girlfriend in Dallas didn't even wait 24 hours, and she drove down to cash it in. And the lottery said, now, you understand that if this card has been altered or changed in any way, shape, form, or fashion, you're going to be arrested. She said, I understand. He said, do you want to fill out an affidavit? She said, I sure do. He said, you understand, if it's been altered, I'm going to arrest you. And she said, I want to sign. He said, sign. She signed. He said, put your hands on the wall. You're under arrest. And she said, wait a minute. Let me, wait a minute. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what happened. She said, my boyfriend, and they called the boyfriend. He said, oh, yeah, that's right. He said, I know it's counterfeit. He said, I've got the real ticket in my pocket. He said, I had two girlfriends. He said, I didn't know which one I could trust. He said, I thought I'd cast them. So the one girlfriend went to prison for two years, and the other girlfriend went to Vegas, and they got married. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of a lesson. Does anybody else have any quest a question? Yes? Uh, the guy that um, you, you wanted to learn bridge from, he had another job as his job was as a mafia bookkeeper. He was, job was a mafia. Did that ever impact you in any way, his, his primary profession? Wow, sounds like Eric DeCamps is up here asking that question. You know, <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out a way to answer that without saying nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. He, he and I eventually played. It took me five years, but eventually we played. And when we played, he, he bet on the game, and I was real nervous. And after the game, he put me up against the wall, he put his finger in my face, and he cussed me out. And he said, don't ever ask me to play again until you learn how to play, because you don't know how to play. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me, because I thought I was really good, and I wasn't. I wasn't even close. One of the problems that we have in Magic is oftentimes people won't tell us when we're bad. They'll just say, oh man, that was great. That was so good. I loved it. You, you were as good as you've ever been. <laughs> I mean, that's not good. I mean, what, what I, I'll tell you one funny story. I, I work with a program called PEP. PEP, -E and it's in Texas, and it stands for Prisoners Entrepreneurial Program. And what it is, it's a program to help prisoners get out of prison on how to create life skills to do well. So I'm down there for an event, and a guy sits down across from me. He's a young kid, about 25, and he's got a business plan. And he's about to start a new business. And so I'm going to talk to him for about 10, 15 minutes and tell him, what I think of his idea. Now I want you to imagine you're in my place and a young convict sits down and it's your first time in prison sitting across from a convict. 
And he said, I'm about to start a food truck. That's what I want to do. And I said, man, you got the right guy. I love food. He said, I'm going to start. I said, you ever worked on a food truck? He said, nope. I said, you ever owned one? He said, nope. I said, what do you know about labor? Nothing. What do you know about food costs? Not a thing. I said, well, what's your dessert? He said, well, I got a great dessert. He said, you start with a bowl of vanilla ice cream. I said, that's a good start. Then what? He said, you cover it with dill pickles. <laughs> and I thought, this don't sound good. He said, then what? He said, well, then you take powdered Kool-Aid and you pour the powdered Kool-Aid over the dill pickles. Now, he's enthusiastic about this. This is like, imagine a guy with a magic effect that's just awful. I'm trying to figure out diplomatically how to tell him that Vanilla ice cream, dill pickles, and powdered Kool-Aid is not going to work. So I'm, I'm stumbling over my words trying to figure out what do you say to this guy. I'm trying. And finally he said, oh, I, well, I'm not going to use the word that he used because I am not going to use any bad four-letter words. He said, oh, Mr. Beck, don't worry about it. He said, I'm just with you. That's not really my idea. He said, I just want to see if you'd tell me the truth. And then let me tell you what my real idea was. So he, he was testing me to see if I would be honest with him because he's been lied to his whole life. He's been in prison. He doesn't know. I mean, he's been lied to forever. So I think one of the things in magic, if you find somebody that will be honest and say, you leaked, you flashed, I've seen what you've done. You're, you're much better placed. So I've been real lucky. I, I'll be honest with y'all. I've been really lucky. I, I got lucky with Sandy Rhodes because he was nice to me for whatever reason. He didn't have any need to be, but he was. And I've often wondered what would have happened if I hadn't gone to that event? What if I hadn't met Sandy? What if I hadn't found out about the IBM? Another thing that happened that really made a big difference is there's a guy named John Mooring. I don't know if any of you knew John. John Mooring was a great magician. He became the editor of MUM, and when he took over the MUM, he called me and he said, Norman, I'd like you to write a column for, for the MUM. I'd never written anything in my life. I said, you got the wrong guy. He said, no, no, I want you to write a column. I said, what do you want me to write about? He said, anything you want. I don't care. I said, well, what if I write it and I, I misspell words? He said, I'll correct it. I said, what if I put the sentence structure and it's bad? He said, I'll fix it. I said, well, if the words don't make sense? He said, I'll rearrange them so they do. I said, well, if you're going to do all that, I said, won't you just write it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but what it caused me to do is it caused me to look at everything around that involves magic and see how I could make a story about it and write about it. So it caused me to really look at the world rather than just see the world. And that's made a big difference because I, I'm always looking. There was a guy, I won't, I won't badmouth anybody because I, I'm, that, that, I don't believe that's right, but there was a young kid that was at the Magic Castle that call, called a customer a really, 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 really bad name. And he wasn't Catholic. He used a really bad, two really bad words. So I called this kid. I said, what, what happened? What, 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 what occurred? And he said, well, I was working the bar down at the, down the lounge by the, by the library. And I said, yeah. I said, what happened? He said, well, these two guys came in. And he said, the guy was a heckler. I said, what happened? He said, well, they walked up to the bar, and the guy pulled out his billfold, and he put $20 in the tip jar. He said, show me a trick. I said, what did you do? He said, well, I showed him a trick. I said, then what happened? He said, he pulled out another 20 and he dropped it in the tip jar. He said, show me another. I said, then what happened? He said, he pulled out that billfold and he put another 20 in. He said, show me another one. I said, get to the heckling part. He said, that was it. He said, all he wanted to do was take his billfold out and put $20 in the tip jar. Now, guys, I want to tell you something. 
If I'm working behind the Magic Castle and you come up and all you want to do is put $20 in a tip jar, we're going to do magic all night long. And I'm going to say, you know what? If you like that $20 trick, I got a $40 trick that's unbelievable. Would you like to do a $40 trick? Because we're going to, and let me tell you something. He's going to run out of 20s before I run out of tricks because I'm going to change four aces to four jacks and I'm going to four, to four jacks to four kings. I'm, we're going to, he just did not understand. He thought it was about him. And the minute you think magic is about you, you're wrong because it's not about you. It's about them. And thank you. Thank you all for having me. I hope you had a good time. Thanks so much. I think it's great. What a wealth of knowledge Norm Beck is. Tremendous stories. I learned a lot. He's a real brilliant man. Loved uh, Norm Beck's gave many words of wisdom that I greatly enjoyed. I enjoyed him a lot. I thought he was a lot of fun, had some great stories. Norman is a wonderful writer. I love his columns and his magazine. Um, he's funny. He's a great guy.